We are live. Welcome to the show proper. Show proper. All right. Welcome to PDQ Live. Uh, I, we have a lot of special guests this time, so I just want to dive right into it. We've got mm-hmm. basically the who's who of PowerShell. I don't know if they'd agree with the that I said, but we've got Jason Helmick, Stephen Booker, Danny Martins, and Sydney Smith, who we had the opportunity to meet at Summit. And they agreed to come on and help us talk about what's upcoming in PowerShell. I it's think, a big show. Okay, okay, Kelly said I'd botch it, so we brought in the professionals. Well, yeah. <clears throat> Let's see. Welcome, right. everyone. <clears throat> Thanks for having us. All right. So I guess the first thing is takeaway. The very first time we had the, the state of the show, we were talking about how you've had a billion sessions in PowerShell since October, like every month. It's, it's nice yeah. that it's, it's taken off. It's, it, I mean, something's working. <laughs> yeah well you want let me let me see i can pull up the latest uh if you give me a moment but yeah in in march um so uh we track you know powershell sessions and so um yeah i'm responsible for a lot of the telemetry and so it's uh, been pretty crazy seeing the telemetry just jump jump and jump every month so uh powershell 7 alone had uh oh boy yeah 1.3 billion sessions in March alone, and it looks like we're still kind of on track for crossing over a billion in uh, in April. Um, I just it, we're a little delayed on some of the telemetry, so it should it should yeah should be over a billion again. So it's it's pretty it's pretty remarkable that uh, PowerShell is getting consistently over a billion sessions a month. Um, I'm responsible for at least three of those. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the funny part is, is that when we started, there was probably only a couple hundred a month back in the day. But the, 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 what I find so funny is when Stephen came up and was like, we just crossed a billion. I'm like, we're going to have to change this into a McDonald's symbol or something, <laughs> da, 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 because we're, you know, billion served per month. So I thought that was pretty cool. All right. Uh, so during summit, there's a lot of stuff like what's new, but a lot of stuff that's coming down the pipeline. Uh, I don't want to like derail anyone. So I figured I'd just let you guys take the lead in anything you guys want to talk about for what's upcoming. Um, I, I know a couple of them are not live yet. I don't know if uh, we we're going to be able to show those, but I guess what, what's well, the Sid- thing that's most excited for? Sydney's the best at this. <laughs> take it away. Sure. So I think this is something that's been what's coming new for quite a while now. Um, so forgive me if you've heard this one before, but PowerShell Get V3 is the thing that I'm really excited about. We didn't talk about it much at Summit um, just because it's been coming down the pipeline for quite some time, but it's finally like for real, like for real this time, really coming soon. Um, So I'm so excited about that. So if you aren't familiar, PowerShell Get is the module that allows you to uh, manage packages in PowerShell. So it's the thing that allows you to install modules, find modules, publish modules, update modules, that sort of thing. Primarily, folks use this with the PowerShell gallery, but you can also use it with a variety of other types of repositories, like your local repository. Maybe you have an artifactory stream or something else. Um, And so what's exciting about um, PowerShell Get v3 is that we've removed a number of the dependencies. We've fixed a number of bugs and longstanding issues with PowerShell Get v2. Um, We fixed a bunch of performance issues and really just made a lot of improvements with PowerShell Get v2. Um, we're getting close to shipping um, GA, and what we're really close to is shipping in PowerShell um, 7.4 previews. We're targeting May, which is um, coming just a couple weeks away. Um, PowerShell Get Beta 21 is hopefully shipping next week. Um, so that's coming very soon. Um, so lots of exciting stuff happening there, and that's something that is really exciting to me. Um, I think one thing that I'm most excited about with PowerShell Get v3 is just that it's going to enable you to more seamlessly work with a lot more repositories beyond just PowerShell Gallery, which is something we've really invested in with um, v3. So uh, one example of this is working with credential persistence. So you can provide credentials at registration time, and they should just seamlessly work when you go to find, install, that sort of thing. So it should work a lot better with, say, your Artifactory feed, for example. Azure DevOps is another example. Um, it should now work with NuGet v3 feeds instead of just NuGet v2 feeds. Um, and then we have future looking plans to really expand and work with a variety of more types of repositories as well. Okay. So with, awesome. With the, I have a question, uh, Sydney, about 
you know, I know you are all project managers or product managers on the PowerShell team, but sure, yeah. what, what products or which parts of PowerShell are you responsible for? Sure. Yeah. So totally. I own a lot of the PowerShell tooling space. So I work on PowerShell get PowerShell gallery. Um, I own the PowerShell like editing and development space. So things like editor services, VS code extension, um, script analyzer, um, and secret management. And then I own a few things within the PowerShell project itself, mostly in the compliance space, things like, um, security, what distributions we support, um, and then some stuff related to community as well. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So well, based on that list, did you leave any room for the other product managers right. for it to cover? <laughs> they do so much. They do so much. I promise. She did it. it, was, it just, you need to give us some work. We're just here. You're your cheerleaders. So. We, 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 we take notes and carry your water. That's what we do. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, well, I, I, I could jump in a little bit. I, I, I uh, you know, I own PS Read Line and some of the PowerShell telemetry, and uh, you kind of talked about some new stuff and um, that we're excited about. And I actually, this will give me a good opportunity to talk about like, this is probably going to be the the quickest release to announcement thing. Uh, you know, I, I don't know on this podcast or not, but literally just yesterday we released a brand new beta for PS Read Line. Um, PS Read Line version 2.3 beta one just released yesterday. And so we have some cool stuff that I haven't even had a chance to download it and show it off. So I'm trying to do that right now. But um, uh, we have done some awesome improvements to PowerShell predictors, PS Read Line and in, uh, predictive IntelliSense. Um, we're also making some improvements to this thing we're calling uh, feedback providers, which I talked a little bit about Summit, but basically after a, an error has occurred, we can kind of help assist you in in the error that's happened, give you a little bit more of a jump start to recover from those errors. Um, but a lot more info about those uh, coming down the month, uh, coming down the pipeline soon. Um, awesome, yeah. PS Readline is an amazing module. Uh, I know it is available for most people, but could you just kind of break down briefly what it does for people who maybe aren't aware that they're using it or kind of just getting started and maybe how to install the pre-release beta version? Yeah, sure. Um, let me, uh, oh, give me one second here. Can I share my screen? Is that? Yep, absolutely. Or is, how do I? Okay. Uh, okay, can you see my screen? Oh, no, I have to hit share again. It gives me a preview. Wow, I like this. I'm not used to Zoom. So, <laughs> Are we gonna... okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. There we go. Mm -hmm. Zoom in. I can... um, Is it possible to zoom it in a little bit? I think yeah. for those at home. Yeah, yeah. so I, I just wanted to show off the PS Reline uh, uh, repo that kind of gives a good list of kind of some of the stuff that uh, PS Readline provides uh, for, for your editing experience. So PS Readline is an inbox module that ships with PowerShell. The latest version is 2.2.6. That's the latest stable version. Um, and there's lots of cool syntax coloring, simple error uh, notifications, good multi-line experience, key bindings, different editing mode, um, all this sort of stuff. We also have these really, really cool uh, predictors um, that uh, help with accelerating your history and enhancing your experience. So as you're typing, it can kind of help uh, grab what you, you've last typed and see if that's the right thing that you want. Um, and so uh, it's pretty cool that way. And like I said, we just released a new beta uh, to yesterday. So um, I can jump over and show, maybe try to show off some stuff that might be a little easier for users. So you'll see here, as I'm starting to type, uh, this is probably too tiny. Is that better? I don't know. I, I, I can't think, see the. I think at that one we should should be able to mostly read it. Yep. Okay. Cool. Well, as I'm typing here in my console, you'll see I kind of have a grayed out uh, version of something that's it's, it's suggesting. So it's pulling from my history. So um, uh, as I'm typing, it will try to suggest the best uh, command based on my history or other predictors installed. There's two kinds of predictors. Uh, the plugin predictor, which is kind of an extensible model that you that you can import different mod PowerShell modules that help give you something you've never written before. Um, and then we have history predictors, which takes what you've written before and uses their history as kind of the source as you're typing to try to accelerate that. So um, this is the inline view, and then I can show off the really cool uh, list view here. 
um, if I press F2 here, and this is actually on the beta, so um, you'll see kind of some new, new stuff here, but uh, you'll see kind of my history sources of what I've typed previously. Um, and then I've been using this uh, plugin model called AZ Predictor. This is part of the AZ suite of modules. So az.tools.predictor is the full module name that helps suggest kind of, it uses a, a machine learning model uh, to best give you uh, suggestions from the AZ suite of modules. There's over 4,000 commandlets in that suite of modules. And so it's kind of hard to know everything that you need to know. And so kind of as you're typing, it can I help uh, help you a little bit more with some of the parameter names, parameter uh, descriptions, and, and stuff like that. Um, so I think wow. by default it changed to the predictor has history on by default, but if they want to add other ones, they have to change it to history and plugins and then get the specific plugin for the module they're using. Um, no, so actually, uh, so if I do set, so typically you'd have to set your PS3 line option for predictor source as history and plugin. Um, this will be on by default. Uh, the thing is you won't have any plugin predictors installed by default. Okay. So then all you have to do is install these modules uh, um, off the gallery and then uh, import them and then they'll be available for you uh, uh, on your on your on your system. And then you can just put them in your profile so they're always persistently there. And uh, yeah, it just works like that. That is so hey, Steven? cool. Yeah. yeah, Stephen, is that a change from what we used to do with PS? Did, did it used to be history and now we're doing history and plugin as the default or am I just misremembering all that? Um, I believe it's it's history. It's always been history and plugin. History and plugin. Uh, okay, cool. Yes, yeah, since plugins aren't really available on default, you don't really see it until you kind of import it. And so that alone gives a, a good experience to the users. So they can just install it and right away it's, it, it's going. So. So it sounds like this really opens up the door for some very cool predictors as time goes on. And that's what I really like about PS Readline in general is it really makes the console slash terminal experience so much more enjoyable. Um, it sounds like that's kind of your area of focus a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, that's definitely my area of, uh, of focus is kind of the, um, the uh, assistance in, in the shell. I, I kind of have, a theory that I've been thinking about for a long time that just the shell needs to be a little bit more assistive in, in all sorts of areas, error recovery, error prevention, and kind of just general assistance when working with PowerShell. It's, there's, there's so many tools and so many different capabilities you can do with PowerShell commandlets, but also just native commands, other executables. You know, the shell, the, the, the CLI was, at least for me, it was the first thing that I was ever taught about uh, when, when learning about computer programming. And I think that's pretty, pretty common in schools. And so, um, you know, it's, it's taught as a very rudimentary kind of basic uh, tool, but it, it can be really, really powerful as, as kind of been seen through what users of PowerShell are using it for and um, all sorts of stuff out there. So it's, it's pretty amazing, pretty amazing. So, yeah, and, and I, I would just add that um, the work that Steven's doing is, I mean, it's really challenging because from our perspective, I mean, if you think about it, there's a lot of stuff that you're seeing out there right now on AI, right? Chat GPT and different solutions like a, a great um, uh, uh, thing to check out is Doug Fink's module um, on working with AI. There's a lot of different ways that we could just throw things into PowerShell and see what sticks, but that's not really the way that we like to do things with PowerShell. See, PowerShell, we, we, what we would like to do is find the best way to be able to expose this assistance and help to you. So while we are interested in doing uh, prototypes and all that, we're kind of conservative because with PowerShell, I mean, let's face it, if we make a mistake, we could, we could break a billion people, right? We take a look at our monthly session runs. So we're kind of uh, careful down this road. And Stephen is really um, putting the pieces together. He's got, you know, between entrance and exit from when you have success and failure, when you're starting a command, exiting a command, how do we assist you? He's really trying to work this out so that in the design of a CLI, what's the best way to bring the assistance? And really your feedback on PS Readline, these betas, your, su your suggestions, your ideas on, hey, you know what, I see what you're doing, but have you thought about trying this? Those are all really helpful to us. And, and Steven's blazing some trail here. So the more feedback, the better. So I, I do want to mention, and this one's not brand new, I think it's been out for about a year, but the inline help 
with PS Read Line where you can hit F1 based on a certain parameter and it'll oh. take you to the help documentation for that without leaving your console. That is I'm, amazing. Okay, I think I could show that real quick. I don't know where the share button is on, on this particular tool, but it, so uh, let me just say, yeah, that we internally, it, we've referred to that as dynamic help. There were a couple of features that were added to PS Read Line that I thought were really great. Um, Again, I don't know where the share button is, but I'll I'll, I'll pretend as if I did. Um, the if you start typing and you, you you have your cursor at a commandlet, you could just press F1 to get into the help. See, it used to be in the old days you'd had two console windows up. You'd have one that you were working in and one that you did. You know, you looked at help, you looked at the examples, all that kind of stuff. Well. I don't want two console windows open. I just want one console window open. Oh, is Steven going to show this? Oh, thanks, yeah, Steven. J Jason, I found the share button again. So it's, yeah, I, think they, I, I think they moved it. So, um, no. so oh, if I'm really just nice of you. Um, if yeah, I'm just go ahead, man. Here, um, you know, I got the command. Let, my cursor's at the end. Press F1 here. It'll take me to the, it'll do the alternate screen buffer to the help of the, uh, of that particular command. Let. The and then best all I have to do is press this? two to go back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the best part that I really love about this implementation is that you're going to this alternative screen buffer, but it doesn't mess up the work you were working on. So you sit there, go through the help file, you can copy something, hit Q to quit, and you're back to the screen that you were working on, and you can drop stuff in. A lot of folks, I think, would find this easier. Um, along with this, though, we did add a couple of other things uh, to dynamic help uh, besides F1. Oh, and by the way, if if you were over a parameter, I think Steven's doing that now and you hit F1, it takes you right to the help for F1. Steven, you're doing a great job driving. Thank you. Um, um, the other thing is, is if you have a longer uh, command on your screen, let's say that uh, um, IntelliSense, um, the predictive IntelliSense delivers you some longer line with arguments on your screen as you're typing. Um, you can use Alt-A. Oh yeah, just pick anything, uh, Steven. Try to it's do something like with- an argument. Something like this. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Yeah. This one if, you hit, cool. if you hit Alt-A, it'll bounce you to the arguments. So you can just get there really fast. So a, a, a lot of times when I'm using predictive IntelliSense, I'll accept the line, hit Alt-A, change the argument, bam, go. I see Andrew smiling. I got, I got oh one more gosh. for you though, Andrew. Wow. This is this is for all you folks that are really into making command lights work together on the pipeline. One of the challenges is you have to figure out what gets passed by default and what's passed by property name. And sometimes you have to make some adjustments. Well, the only place you find that data is in the help file. Well, one of the other things that we did is, is if you put your cursor over a parameter and hit Alt H, Alt-H will give you that parameter's detailed information so that you can figure out how to make a pipeline work for it. And, and, and Stephen will show it here. And I think, yes, yeah, Stephen, you can just do it there. And it'll come up and it'll give you um, the specific information about how to work with it over a pipeline. It's just a quick way if you're trying to figure out how to get two commandlets to work together, what the deal is between them. Um, so between F1, Alt-A, which is you know kind of my favorite stuff, dynamic help is, is, is pretty cool. We hope that that's really helpful um, to folks. Yeah, yeah, that is super cool. I like Steven said earlier, kind of used to think of the terminal as kind of this, just you type things in and that's kind of it. Maybe tab completion, woohoo, maybe a history. But to see these improvements, um, gosh, I have some new little hotkeys I need to add to my arsenal. Yeah, I, I, I got to be honest with you. The, the, the improvements that um, Steven and Dongbo and the team are working through on PS Readline are really amazing. I think, you know, Sydney, you know, brought up uh, PS Get, which for us, this is a big, big I mean, we've worked long and hard on this. Sydney has worked so long and hard on this. Um, we're very happy to get that out. The new stuff with PS Read Line is really exciting. But, you know, I, there's a lot of exciting stuff we have going. But one of the most exciting things is what Danny's doing with SSH. It excites me beyond belief. Yeah, Danny, there's, a, there's a, lot of, a lot of stuff going on uh, in the SSH space. And I'd say kind of a... Just to reflect this, I'd say if folks are familiar with what I used to work on in Azure Cloud Shell as well, uh, we actually say have shift. I've shifted my time to solely focus on SSH. So the only thing I do day to day is SSH, and that's just to show like the commitment from our team on SSH. And as that as the protocol that we're using in PowerShell remoting, 
uh, for the future. Um, so things that are new in SSH, uh, we've got a lot going on. Uh, uh, we kind of have our regular, uh, we ship into Windows that goes into every, I'd say, major new Windows release. Uh, we have also started uh, shipping it uh, via WinGit. And so if you have WinGit, it's, I'd say, the best way to get the, the latest OpenSSH versions. Uh, we also still release uh, all of our, our betas on GitHub as well. Uh, but there's a lot of exciting things going on. Um, if we're looking at, i say, the future of PowerShell, PowerShell remoting, uh, uh, how how do can we enable SSH? And really, if we look at let's say SSH overall, it's not a problem of hey, we need more features in SSH. SSH is so feature rich. It's just how do we make SSH easier to use for Windows administrators and administrators all up, right? And so, if you talk to folks about I'd say managing SSH. Uh, it's usually they either complain about having to do SSH keys or uh, managing their SSHD config file, which is kind of like a, a settings file for the server side. And so those are things that we're focusing on, I'd say, in this coming semester on how do we make kind of that management experience better for, for SSH? Because we know, like, in or if we want customers to move over from WinRM and uh, off of RDP on server workloads, we know that SSH can't just be the same. It has to be better, right? And even though I say WinRM, I kind of equate it to, I'd say, PowerShell 2, where it's inbox, it's it's there, uh, it's not being worked on, <laughs> uh, but you can still use it if you want, right? Uh, that's kind of where uh, WinRM's at, and that's, that's the standard for PowerShell remoting. And then we look at, I'd say, uh, oh, Windows uh, PowerShell 5.1, where it's 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 still there in box. You have, I'd say, uh, the latest that, I'd say, sh that is just available. And that's kind of like what, what our, I'd say, inbox Windows releases are. And then you have the latest, which is, I'd say, PowerShell 7 or our, our latest releases on GitHub or via WinGit, right? And so we're getting to this point where we want, I'd say, folks to move away from, uh, from WinRM, move on to SSH, and then really move away from RDP for server workloads, just because you can't audit, uh, you can't audit interactive sessions with, I'd say, a, a mouse and uh, a mouse, right? You can't audit point and click, right? We want to move people to SSH and PowerShell remoting. You can audit both of those types of connections. And if you really need a GUI, uh, you have some break glass scenarios with, with SSH where you can do RDP over an SSH tunnel. And there's also things like Windows Admin Center or WAC, if, if folks are familiar with that, where it offers, I'd say, a still GUI-based experience, but it's all backed on PowerShell anyway. So if you go and click a button, I think for 98% of those scenarios, that's really backed by a PowerShell command. So you still have that full auditability baked into that GUI. And so we're really looking at how do we take kind of the remoting space in general and move it towards SSH and WAC. Um, the really cool thing about SSH is it's really extensible. And so what we actually have, have done now is this project called SHARC, uh, which stands for SSH ARC or SSH for Azure ARC enabled servers. And I know some folks will uh, hear Azure and uh, and I say immediately plug their ears or something like that. But I just want to call out that this is uh, an ARC offering, so it works for both Azure and uh, Azure machines as well as AWS, GCP, on-premise machines. And it is a completely free offering, and so it's free to onboard your machine. And Shark specifically uh, is uh, a way to as a connect to your machine. And so if you have an Arc enabled server, which is essentially just taking a non Azure machine and bringing that machine into I'd say the Azure management plane, so you can see it in the portal, you can look at it with I'd say your Azure PowerShell commands. Um, you can then use our Shark to connect to that machine without a public IP address or an inbound port. And so what you can now do is say, hey, I have this machine that I regularly want to connect to. This could be any machine. I use it personally for my desktop, my personal desktop that just sits on my desk at home. Uh, and then say, I want to I want to build a layer of trust between that machine and Azure. And then from any other machine, assuming you can authenticate into Azure PowerShell, you can then create a secure connection from 
I'd say that client you're on to that desired server. And so again, that's without a public IP address, without a, a, a port open, and all of that is free. And so the really cool thing is I can be, I'd say, just out and about on my day. And I, I like to run a lot of IoT devices uh, in my house. So I'll remote via, i say, cloud shell from my phone onto my server, set up an SSH tunnel onto one of my IoT devices, and then I can check the status of these just random devices I have in my house, all just from like cloud shell that's running on my phone. And so, and none of that is ever exposed to, I'd say, an inbound connection anywhere in my home network. So there's a lot of really cool things that we're doing on, I'd say, both in the Azure and Arc space, but really how can we make that impactful for folks who don't necessarily have an Azure footprint? Um, and really bring bring all that. I'd say I'd say rich general SSH. I'd say capabilities back into the into the PowerShell ecosystem as well. Yeah, and I just wanted to add. Make sure, uh, yeah, everybody, make sure you you kind of take a view of what Danny just said to get this into your head, so you don't miss you don't miss the 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 solution that's available. Um, so it's not that you're moving your stuff into Azure. It's that you're mm -hmm. using Azure as your network network infrastructure. Think about this for a second. Think about how complex it is for you to be able to um, use PowerShell or even RDP to a machine that's not in your network. All the stuff you have to set up, you got to set up VPN, you got to make sure it's secured, yada, yada, yada. Well, here's, here's what Danny is saying. Any machine, one that's sitting next to you on-prem, one that's already a VM in Azure, one that's in AWS or GCP, any of your machines can all of a sudden be manageable from anywhere in the world without you doing anything other than making it ARC enabled through Azure, which is free. I mean, how cool and powerful is, is that? Which is, it's free and it's also really painless. Like we provide an onboarding script and it takes maybe a minute to run so it's really easy to set up uh and uh i, I implore you to try it out and the the best thing again it's free so for arc i know last year dan you gave a presentation on arc mm -hmm. at summit so that's going to be up on youtube yeah. if you want to see it in action you can go to the 2022 summit and and find yeah so we go ahead yeah so we did a talk on i'd say shark in 2022 um, I did an updated one on the, in this latest summit, and we're in preview now. But I'd say GA will be sometime in the next few months. So if you if you want to go and look at a demo, there's I'd say the demo from the summit last year, and also if you just search I'd say SSH in Arc, there's plenty of other demos out with I'd say either myself or uh, other I'd say Microsoft I'd say cloud advocates. Yeah, I think the one from this year's summit will be about two months out before it's live, but yep. it's definitely be worth checking yep. out. All right. Uh, earlier on, we mentioned feedback providers, and I don't think we really dove into how cool that was. Does anyone want to, I guess, give a breakdown of what the value of feedback providers, what they can do for us when those are live? Sure, yeah. Um, I was just getting my environment set up here. Uh, I can talk a little bit about feedback providers. Feedback providers um, take a lot of inspiration from PowerShell predictors. Um, we want to create kind of an extensible model that uh, folks themselves can kind of go out and create these things we call feedback providers, which are just PowerShell modules that uh, get triggered on a particular error um, and then can suggest a, a, um, uh, a remediation from that. So give me one moment. Um, actually, Okay, so well, like instead of just like the this. wall of text, it gives you a, this is common, and we've seen, here's a solution, or? Uh, a little bit, yeah. So um, right now, uh, okay, let me see. Yeah. Sorry, give me a second here. Okay, cool. Um, oh, sorry, I'm still always... Confused no, by Zoom. No problem. Too, so used to Teams. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so yeah, um, I can show you just where right now we. This is in the uh, latest PowerShell preview. Uh, right now we have a uh, experimental feature um, called 
uh, PS feedback provider that's right now it's enabled true. So it replaces some of the hard code, you know, suggestion framework stuff that we had previously. It was kind of a very, un, very, very small uh, experimental feature that we were playing with uh, for a while. But say, for example, if I, you can see, well, history predictor is, is helping me out with, with my errors here. So if I misspell an item here, this will trigger the uh, inbox feedback provider that we're calling just kind of the general command not found um, feedback provider that gives this this suggestion here um, to hey you you just may have slipped up on your finger and uh, mistyped uh, a a commandlet here's what you have uh, installed and so um, this gives you kind of a better UI for it and then eventually we do want to bring it so that as soon as I start typing get again it will automatically give me kind of get child item but we're still working on that. Um, but that is kind of the the basic basic idea of of feedback providers is you can kind of have a more list of view. I, I don't have um, I'd have to go to our page. Give me a second to pull up our latest um, uh, other predictor or other feedback provider. Excuse me. Uh, share my screen again. So this is um, uh, what we're calling, this is a, a feedback provider that we built uh, while we were designing feedback providers called the command not found uh, feedback provider. So this very mirrors the experience that you get on Ubuntu systems. If you have a commandlet or, or a command that you haven't installed yet um, on your machine, it will kind of suggest to you, hey, you can um, install this with sudo apt. Right. And so, <coughs> excuse me. And so similarly, you can see this GIF showing off, you know, I try running Python. I don't have Python installed. Our feedback provider says, hey, you have Python 3 installed. You should try that. And um, otherwise, it says, hey, you can also try sudo opt install Python 3. So this is uh, specifically for PowerShell uh, versions running on, on Linux. Um, but uh, it's something that we're, we're building out. And, and we did just did another release of this uh, yesterday, but uh, still still need to uh, Write some blog posts and, and publicize this, but want to show that off. Um, but uh, yeah, we have other ideas to kind of have different feedback providers for different idea, uh, different uh, cases. We've also thought about this as kind of a, a good way to help folks on legacy commands to say, hey, you can kind of look at this uh, for you can try this command out, which is the newer, more supported command that gives you maybe more capabilities as a an alternative. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of feedback providers in a nutshell. Right. So if you're using the error view category view where it gives you kind of a condensed error, is that going to impact these or does it just use the overall error object to come up with the providers or the feedback? Um, it will, it's not going to matter the concise view or not. Um, it will, um, it, it's up to the feedback provider. So we'll be giving the error object to the, we'll, we'll exposing the error object to feedback providers. And so they can decide what they want particularly these ones trigger on the command not found error exception, uh, but it doesn't have to be exclusive to that. I wanted to ask, you know, I know there's a lot of changes happening to PowerShell and there's new releases and things like that. And I know there's a pretty handy commandlet, uh, a command for it, get what's new. Um, Jason, do you want to talk about that at all? Yeah. So, uh, um, yeah. So um, we and, and and Sydney can can uh, can really explain our release cadence. It is it is amazing. We have up to three releases a month, every month, and then a yearly release. So we release a uh, like seven three is a stable release. We also have an LTS release, which is our long term service release. Then we have previews every month. We have previews. Um, there's so much stuff and so much changing going on. That it's hard to follow all of our change logs and stuff like that. So um, uh, one of the folks on the team, uh, Sean Wheeler, decided, hey, let's give everybody a commandlet to make this a little bit easier. So get what's new is a commandlet that will let you see what's new in that current release that you just downloaded. Or you can give it a version and it'll tell you what's new in that specific version. So maybe you're sitting on, I don't know, maybe you're sitting on Windows PowerShell 5.1 uh, and you want to grab 7.0 or something. And you want to find out what's new. You can find out what's new. You can download this module. It's free on the gallery, the, the, the what's new module. And we update this um, 
boy, we update it very frequently to make sure that all of the information is there. So it's a quick, easy way um, just to figure out, hey, what's the latest and greatest? You can also have it set to um, give you a message of the day if you want it in your prompt, like, oh, hey, did you know this? Um, did you know that? And we're going to work on it. We're going to make it a little bit uh, better, a little bit easier to find information. So we're looking for feedback on it. But we're hoping that that helps people kind of weed through all of the new and exciting stuff that's coming out from you know, stuff that they may already know about. Uh, th there is one new uh, system variable that I was a big fan of, and excuse me, this is a long one. Uh, PS native command use error action preference. Uh, so as, if I understand it, that means if you're using something like IP config or something not native built to PowerShell, you can set it to if it returns a non-zero result, which usually means an error, it will use your error action preference within your session. So instead of just continuing on anyway, you can have it stop if that command fails. Yeah, exactly. But, but let me kind of back up for a minute and kind of talk about what we're trying to do in this space. Cause there's, there's more than just one thing. Mm -hmm. um, one of the challenges that, that, that folks run into is um, a couple of things. So PowerShell lets you run any native command that you want. When I say native command, I mean a platform specific. So if you're on Windows, you can run things like IP config. PowerShell does all that great. If you're on Linux, you can run IF config. PowerShell lets you run all that stuff great. Where the challenge comes in is if you're looking at something like Stack Overflow and you see, oh, you know, you type in NPM and all of this are and all of these arguments. If you just copy and paste that into PowerShell, sometimes you run into problems. Here's the kind of problems you run into. Native commands, whether they be Windows or Unix, use the error message, the information pipelines a little bit differently and confusing. So what we've been trying to do is iron things out between them. So you'll see that there's a lot of new features that we added. Um, if you, we have quoting challenges. Um, sometimes you'll drop a, let's say a Linux command in and you get a lot of error messages because it didn't, PowerShell didn't understand that you had three arguments around these quotes, not just one argument in these quotes. And that comes out to where you have to now start adding in quotes, escaping quotes. It can be challenging. So things like that, things like uh, the information streams, the error streams, all of this we've been working on so that as a Linux user, you can go to PowerShell, type in what you would normally do, and it's just going to work. If you're a PowerShell user using a Windows native command, you're going to type in what you're supposed to be able to type in, and it's just going to work. So each one of these is its own long, lengthy issue conversation because of the complexities in there. But what I suggest is people do flip these features on and try your commands and see if they work. If they work the way that you expect, great. If they don't, yeah, that's what we want to know about. And I would suggest you check out our documentation. We have different modes now that you can operate in. We have what we call a standard mode that PowerShell operates in for PowerShell 7. But on Windows, you can ask for a legacy mode. Basically, we don't do any of the quoting rule changes. You may already have come up with workarounds, but we'd also like you to try the new standard just to make it easier. So there's a lot of stuff in this space just so we can make it easier for people to move their, their hands from a Linux box to a Windows box and everything's going to work inside a PowerShell. I like we've, that a lot. That is, <laughs> we've got a couple of questions okay. from the audience, if we can uh, <laughs> jump into those real quick. Uh, first question is, uh, one of the top questions I get asked around PowerShell is, how do I start? Do you have any recommendations for resources to help a new sysadmin start their PowerShell learning journey? Sincerely, Zach. Wow, Zach, what a great question. I don't know, guys, what do you think? What's a good way to get started with PowerShell? I, I have a few suggestions just based on things that I've heard in, in my experience, but um, I can also then pass it along to the team. So I think some of the top resources that I always hear over and over again from members of the community are number one, PowerShell in a Month of Lunches. That's like a book type resource that um, is really popular in the community. Um, P.S. Cohen's, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it's a module that was made by a community member that's kind of like learning through doing that's really popular as well. Um, Jason, our, the one and only, um, made a video series with Jeffrey, um, 
back in the day that is a very popular way to learn PowerShell. And then of course, just like learning through doing, like picking a project, picking something that you want to solve through PowerShell and then just working through it. There's so many resources out there. Like chat GPT today, honestly, great way to learn PowerShell, like picking something and just like working through it that way. Like, um, Google search, that sort of thing. I think for me, that's the biggest way I've learned PowerShell is just picking little projects. Like, okay, I want to automate X thing, opening up VS code and like start doing it. Um, so I, I would say those are my biggest tips, but, um, I would pass it along to the rest of the team and see if folks have other suggestions. Uh, well, I would say with the chat GPT, it does give good advice, but verify because it has been known to just invent modules <laughs> out of the blue. I think I think maybe now that I'm thinking about it more, chat GPT is maybe better when you're more intermediate to advanced and like want to <laughs> help writing your script, but you maybe have some context for what's good PowerShell code and what's not. <laughs> I, could, I can help unblock you, uh, you know, maybe a little bit here and there, but it definitely likes to uh, hallucinate a, a couple of the modules that we wish were available or, or maybe they are just named differently or who knows. <laughs> yeah. I would just say that, um, and I, I wasn't looking for the, uh, the, the shameless plug, but thank you, Sydney. Um, I would just say that, that it, there's a lot of great information out there, but really what's been the industry standard, I think is still the standard today. Don Jones and Jeff Hicks wrote this great book on learn uh, PowerShell in a month of launches. It's been added to by members of this team. Um, uh, uh, that also have written additions into uh, that series. Um, and, and Jeff Hicks is still very active in the community today. So here's an example of somebody that for the last, oh, I don't know, 16 years, we've learned how to do this from. I learned from Don and Jeff in this book series. Um, so I recommend that. The video series that Jeffrey and I did is, uh, excuse me for the, the, the shameless plug, but it, it's still relevant. In other words, 90% of everything we did is exactly how you do it today in PowerShell. The only difference is, is since the time we shot those videos, we've added new stuff. So, but if you want to learn PowerShell, that's still a very great way to do it. And the best part is you get to hear the explanations of why does it exist this way, which is what Jeffrey explains. Um, so if you're really into it, you get to learn about all kinds of interesting things in PowerShell and some very advanced things as well. So getting started, and I think Sydney had a, 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 the best idea, and, and this is for me what works every time when I'm facing a learning challenge. Put my hands on it sit down, take a real world problem. I need to get um, the latest error messages from every server in my network into a web report. Okay, that sounds really hard. It turns out you can do that in one line in PowerShell. Go, figure that out. It's And you might be saying, if you're brand new, you're like, I don't even know where to start. Well, we have commandlets for that. And so you can start to work down by discovering the commandlet, discovering how to build a pipeline. By taking a real world problem and trying to solve it, you know what you expect at the end and you won't be satisfied until you reach that expectation. That's a great way to learn. Yeah, that's something we very commonly hear from our guests on the podcast is get your hands on, do something. It's the best way to learn. And yeah. I'll take this opportunity to shill. If you're in the trenches trying to learn PowerShell and want to support a friend on your shoulder, listen to the PowerShell podcast. We're always interviewing people, reminding you to, to stay on the right track and keep trying to do great things and be efficient. Cool. Totally agree. And one thing I would definitely say on this, and it's one of my favorite stories, and I was reminded of it just recently, is when I first came in, the best place for me to learn PowerShell was this amazing community. When I came in, there was only a handful of us, but here's how I was welcomed. I went to a tech ed and I met, and some of you may have met him if you were at the PowerShell uh, Summit uh, last week, um, Alexander Nikolai, who, who Alexander has been in this uh, the PowerShell site since the very beginning. And in I think it was 2008, 2009, he sat over lunch with me at a tech ed, teaching me PowerShell, introducing me to the community. And so being able to walk up to him today, shake his hand, give him a hug, it's a real emotional thing because he helped me. And that's what this community does. And it still does it today. At the summit last week, we were amazed. We saw 50 to 60% brand new people. 
coming into this community and the community still, everybody wants to help everybody. So please reach out, go to the forums, get hooked up into the community, show up to some of the events that the community does. That's where you're really going to learn PowerShell, this podcast. <laughs> so we did have uh, somebody uh, ask, what was the name of your video series? It looks, if they wanted to look it up. Um, so, and, and here's the funny thing. There's actually four. Um, there's a, I think they called it getting started with PowerShell. And I think it was PowerShell three. Um, anything you see with Jeffrey Snover on it is, is really what you want. So there's a getting started. And then we did an advanced of how to uh, basically tool, do tool making. Oddly enough, both those they're each about 20 hours long. They're very in-depth. And oddly enough, they match very closely to the Don Jones, Jeff Hicks books. You could almost use them together um, to back each other up. I, I wonder how that happened. Um, at any rate, <laughs> um, but there's also a series we did a little bit later than that. If you're into one of my favorite things, Desired State Configuration, we did a series on DSC, which I have to just say that series on DSC is still relevant today. But if you came to Summit last week, you also heard that we are in development on DSC3 and we are making it completely different. So um, you're going to want to stay around with us over the next year or so as we're working on the development of that. And if you're into desired state configuration, I think you're going to enjoy where we're headed with that as well. So, nice. but yeah, those videos are out there. All right. We've got one last question before we wrap up. Y'all ready for this? This could be an easy one, or it could be difficult. I don't know. What is the command to update PS7 to newest version or to get new versions available? Well, I'll take this, Jordan. All right, yeah. Okay. It's <laughs> so, so I was just thinking, I don't know the exact command because I just use the VS Code extension, and mm -hmm. every time I'm in there, it says, hey, you have an outdated PowerShell. Mm -hmm. And so I just click yes. So uh, as far as the command, well, hopefully the... Uh, Experts can chime in and let us know that one. Well, I think the reason you're seeing all of us pause, and I'll, I'll let um, the rest of the team jump in, is the reason that we're pausing is my first question is, is what platform are you on? <laughs> See, uh, this is where some of the challenges are. If you're on Mac or Linux, uh, if you're on Mac, I use Brew. If you're on Linux, use whatever package manager you want. I guess what the point is, is that when we release PowerShell, we release the packages for all versions, all platforms that we support. And you can use any package manager to grab it. One of the things that, you know, um, we're working on the Windows side is on the Windows side, we don't really have a commandlet, but we're coming out with one. Um, we're getting a new command into Windows called install PowerShell 7. Um, I can't give you an exact timeline on that, but that command will be available in Windows hopefully, maybe at the end of the year, don't hold me to it, but that's what I'm shooting for. Um, that command will allow you to install and upgrade PowerShell like that, super easy. The other way you can do it if you're on Windows, you can go out to our GitHub and download the MSI and do it that way. You can also get PowerShell 7 from the Microsoft Store if you're on Windows, um, a couple of different ways to do it. So if you need to deploy PowerShell 7 in larger scale, well, then you're gonna wanna use whatever your deployment mechanism is, like uh, you know System Manager, uh, uh, System Center Configuration Manager, uh, whatever tools that you're, you're using for that. So it's kind of platform dependent it, and we don't have a one-size-fits-all solution yet, but I would say, yeah, check back here in the future because some of you may have heard that we're spending a lot of time working with Winget, and they're spending a lot of time coming up with ways to deploy many things on Windows. And with Winget, we're sure to have a PowerShell installation method uh, going through Winget at some point as well. So the, the alpha yeah. for the PowerShell module went live like a week and a half ago? So it's, it's yeah, still Demetrius new. lit that up. Yeah, <laughs> it is still brand new. And I, and I just want to say something. If you are into Winget in any shape, way, or form, the product manager, Demetrius Nellen, uh, that's, uh, uh, that owns that um, uh, product, um, is is taking orders now. I mean, he stands up and, and is, he, he says, buck stops here. You got any problems with this? Talk to me now, because I am going to fix this and make this right, because he is pushing this to do incredible things down the road. He's working with our team and with us on desired state configuration. Demetrius really wants to make this work for you. And something else I'd throw out on that, 
is when you find a product manager that wants to work with you, set flame off. That's a good time <laughs> to stop yelling and screaming. And it's a great time to just start giving them the information and working with them. In other words, you got a friend. Make sure that you're, you know, remember, we're all humans trying to work together on this stuff and, and get through it. And and it's really tough. It's really hard, especially when you have a lot of people telling you really bad things about your humanity. Uh, it makes it a little bit harder. Um, so, you know, Demetrius is out there. Let's work with him and, and try to make that great. All right. Well, uh, at this point, people have to get back to work. But I just want to say thank you for everyone for tuning in to watch me live my dream. <laughs> I, I appreciate you guys spending the time with us. This has been amazing for me. Uh, hopefully we see a lot more interaction. People, if they're looking for something, they know where to reach out. Uh, but uh, thanks for joining us for PDQ. I'm Jordan. I'm Tara. Thanks hey, for joining me with you guys. And thank you all for joining our webcast today. If you like what you've seen today, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Leave us your comments below. Listen to the PowerShell podcast and just be happy. Okay, and we'll see you back here next week.